gosh, um, how do I follow that, really? A bit nervous when he asked who the losers were in the industry, and <laughs> I was sort of just covering my badge, just getting a bit concerned, and uh, thanks for following that up. I'm pleased to hear that, actually, the things I'm talking about are on the winner's sheet, object storage. Hey, great stuff, right? So one of the things I want to talk about today is really about what I do. My name is Mark Lucas. I head up the systems engineering team at HGST in our cloud uh, storage division. We sell a variety of different things from helium drives, our biggest drive. Anyone know what that is today? Ten Brilliant. Ten terabytes. Oh, oh that's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Health and safety. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Should <laughs> Yeah. So 10 terabytes, helium drive. Chris was talking about it earlier on. Huge amounts of engineering have gone into those products. Yeah. We have 4,000 odd employees around the world. We're a very large storage company. Anyone else know anything about HGST? What's happened to where we fit? Yeah. So we're part of Sandis. Did you want me to contribute to that? Yeah, well, I don't know, I don't know, right. So there's two things. We're part of Western Digital, who has obviously made the acquisition of Sandisk, and that puts us in a very, very interesting place in terms of the product breadth that we have. And it was really nice to see an HGST drive up on a couple of the presentations earlier. So for me, really, where we're fitting in as a company is around the end of a slideshow. <laughs> Let's go back a bit. Let's try and take this back, so... Good start. Right, so I go out every day and I talk to customers. That's my job. And normally what happens, I hand a business card over and I listen and I have a cup of tea and I tell them a little bit about HGST and what I'm doing in the cloud. And they start to talk to me about data longevity and the treasure troves of data that they have. Some of these prospects and customers get very, very nervous about data that resides on solutions over five years. We back it up to tape. We have multiple copies. We have a design team looking at our storage every single day to make sure some of these data sets are protected for long periods of time. Would anyone like to guess, with some of these customers, when they start to look at data analysis and planning, what sort of time scale? About a year. Gosh, that's... Uh, <laughs> Well, that's a very good response. A little bit less than that, actually. But, uh, 100 years. Uh, it's about 20 years, realistically, that people look at this stuff. And then if you look at some of these prospects, a good one here is EPFL. They're a customer of ours. And I love them. They're really bright guys. They're based in Lucerne, in Switzerland. And they're part of the UNESCO Heritage uh, Foundation. Yeah, they do a lot of data storage for them. And they're a really nice bunch of people. They're very clever. And we were sitting there, and we were talking about how good our products were, and they're like, yeah, Mark, we know, we use it. It's very exciting. But the key thing they were saying to me was, data heritage has almost been a journey for them. And we sat there, and we were talking about erasure coding, and we sat there, and we were talking about the next generation of our API. And the guy was really nice. He said, you know, let's stop. Let me tell you about our story. And I said, OK, let's do that. We got up, and we went down. Went past this beautiful data center. Don't get me wrong, it was like a work of art. Carried on walking and went round the back, and there's this grotty silver door that's been painted and got some keys out. And we walked through and we're down a little alley again, and it was getting dimmer and dimmer to like a little bunker place. And then we opened another door, and at the back was a grey filing cabinet. And he put opened the grey filing cabinet, and in there were some cartridge tapes. Remember cartridge tapes, technology? I loved it, Sundays when I was around. And he was really proud, and it was really nice. And he had a little booklet, and there's an iPad app that you could look these things up. And he was explaining, he said, this is where our heritage of data started from. We still got it. We put it all onto your systems. But this is where we started from. And the thing that was degrading wasn't actually the tapes. It was just the labels. The handwriting on them was beautiful, but the ink was degrading. And I looked at him and I said to him, do you use any of this stuff? And he said, yeah, occasionally we get someone coming back and asking us to restore something. I said, that's good. I like that. And he said to me, he said, yeah. And I said, well, you know, usually listening to lots of people, tape is a bit of a challenge sometimes with older tapes. They degrade. And he said, no, no, we've never had any real problems with our tapes. 
So I'm like, oh, that's interesting. So, you know, sometimes that's good. But he was recording that in. He was really proud of that data. The next thing, we went off, went around again, down a dar even more narrower corridor. And again, another grey door. And this time, it had two padlocks on it. I thought, oh, sugar, here we go. What's going to happen next? And again, we walked through, and he had a grey cabinet. But this time, it was trays. We pulled it out. You were in the room, Ryan. LTO tapes. LTO1, LTO2, LTO3, LTO4. He had the lot. He was really proud that he's actually kept his tape libraries all up to date. Some had barcodes on, some had written labels. But he said to me, he said, Mark, when we were starting out on our journey, we just had no idea of data planning. We're bright guys. We always sort of listened to vendors. And they were talking about, you know, the next generation of products going to improve this one. And tape is dead. Do you remember that statement? Stupid. Tape is dead. So these are the sort of things that I listen to when I go out and I talk to customers. And I say, oh, that's great. OK, we've got some solutions around that. So moving swiftly on, lots of uh, graphical stuff. I was chatting to one of my colleagues um, in the US, because apparently the US knows best. We've got Trump coming along. <laughs> uh, <it's>, uh, <laughs> yeah, lots of innovation happens in the US, right? And one of the key things that they said to me, he said, you know, we're talking to, this is the American Library Association, right? And they've got a massive challenge with big data. They use Hadoop. Everyone heard of Hadoop? HDFS? What's the benefits of Hadoop? Silence. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Sorry? Spot on, right? It's really good. If general purpose computing you can build yourself a Hadoop cluster, you can run HDFS on it. You can do some MapReduce or MapR if you're sort of a bit clever. And then basically, you can do real-time analytics. The thing he said to me, which is really interesting around this, is they're looking to put in one of our object storages and connect to their Hadoop cluster using an S3A interface, where they're looking to archive Hadoop data, which is almost the opposite of what Hadoop's all about, which is really interesting. The other thing he said to me, he said, we used to have a lot of people working in the center bit. It's a data store. We used to have about 20 guys walking around with lots of white coats, changing drives, the usual sort of stuff. And he opened up a, a little slot here, and it had a really complex set of boxes, tons of arrows everywhere. And then he showed me what they have today. And it was less boxes and less arrows. And he loved it. That was this big thing. We've actually simplified our data center by leveraging cloud economics, by leveraging object storage, which I'm talking about today. But at the same time, we've redeployed some of those people into things like data curators, adding metadata. Everyone know what metadata is? Yes? I'm a bit worried. A few knows. But this is really around taking data that you ingest in, you put some additional information around it, and store it into an object store. So there are three th Can you see this, actually, this slide? Ingest. Access. The other thing is access. Right, they ingest all this data in. There is pressure almost instantly to get that out to everybody. New journal comes out. We ingest it in. We have a data curator down here doing some metadata work. And then they want to get it out to everybody as quickly as possible, right? The key thing is there's still lots of arrows around here. Legal, copyright, infringement, data security. Anyone heard about that? So this is really exciting for HGST because lots of our technology, the Active Archive does in data encryption at the disk level, and we do data encryption in flight as well on our systems. Oh. Hello? <laughs> okay. The battery's gone. Yeah, yeah. Page down. <laughs> it's taking time out of my slot. I'm a bit upset now. <laughs> okay, I'll move on. All right. So, um, my next slide. Thank you. Uh, I'll, get, I'll get used to it. My next slide was really about data durability, right? So all these customers and people I talked to and the guys in the US are all talking about data durability. How reliable is a disk drive? 
How good is my erasure coding? Am I going to use traditional NFS, CFSI, SCSI, fiber channel? I don't really care what connection method I use. Am I going to keep it there? I'm going to do three copies. Yeah, true copy, SRDF, da 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 da, snap mirror, snapshots, all the usual stuff, right? Very good. The thing about it is, the key thing that no one ever talks about is this term durability. Average cloud provider on the network, biggest cloud providers in the world, what level of durability does that have? How many nines does a cloud provider offer? Zero. Zero nines? Correct. There is no guarantee. It's in the T's and C's. In. That's a, a bit of an open thing. Read some of the T's and Sorry, C's. I was well, <laughs> <laughs> so realistically, last time I looked last night, it was about 12 nines is what they talk about. 12 nines durability. Fantastic. We offer in our systems, our object storage, 15 nines durability. Pretty good. Better than a cloud provider in certain circumstances. Get that in. <laughs> But at the same time as well is the utilization. We don't do multiple copies, and this is why. We use erasure coding. Everyone heard of erasure coding? Solomon Reed or Reed Solomon, depending which part of the country you're from. Provides two to three bits of object durability. It's pretty good. I looked at some of the maths. I'm quite like a bit doing a bit of maths. The issue is if you change some of the erasure coding with Reed Solomon, what happens? Anyone done that? Nobody's done it. OK, no one knows. So things happen. You have to add more disks. You have to add more systems. And the system slows down with Reed Solomon. If you look at bit spread, and this is some of the things that really is innovation. OK, gosh, really run out. Do a bit longer, a bit longer. It's around our rateless erasure coding. We encode things very, very differently to most people. And probably the most important thing, if you take anything today, is we do two to three equations to decode an object. And this is how it works. And again, the slides will be available, I believe, and they're recorded, so you can have a look at this. But basically, we take an object in our object store. We do some very clever technology around erasure coding. The difference from us is it only takes two to three equations to decode that object, which means I can run in the background on our active archive system checking. I'm constantly proactively looking at the data on the disk drive. Bit spread. This is how it works. Again, I don't think I've got time to go through this, but if someone wants to grab a paper and a pad, I'll go through it afterwards with them. This is something around the next generation. I'm not saying RAID is dead. I'm not saying any of that sort of thing. But this is an equivalent solution to dealing with silent data corruption. Real world example. We put an object in. Everyone familiar with S3? Put, get, delete. We erase your code it. We put all those bits across the drives. Very cool. And we press it there, and we divide those objects that we actually upload into 18 bits. And on those, it requires 13 bits to decode an object. The second one comes in, and we spread it across. So using erasure coding, we can have what? What does it give us? It gives us one thing. A whole tray can fail. The second thing it gives me is I can have a tray and two disks that can fail, and I still have no downtime. The second thing is it's a thing called fail in place. Anyone heard that? The old days in RAID school, oh my god, a drive's broken, let's run across, put a new drive in before the RAID reconstructs, Christmas tree lights, everything's flashing. With erasure coding and this type of technology, if something breaks, you don't have to worry about it. Change it next week. Yeah? It's much more durable, 15 durability. What happens if we geo-disperse erasure coding? And again, I can do this later with people. But we start to spread the bits into three locations. And again, this gives me, oh, gives me significant um, reliability in terms of data archiving. And then the last bit really is around self-healing. How about a system that self-heals itself? It goes off proactively, looks at the data on the disks, grabs it all back, and checks each one why you're not doing anything. So you could be still using the system, but it's proactively managing that type of technology in the background. If it finds an object that it can't decode, what does it do? It reconstructs the object. To you as a user, you don't even know it's going on. It's really clever. Uh oh So this is the last thing. One product slide, I'm done. So HGST, we're all about looking after. Data is a treasure. And if you look at what we actually sell today, and Davide, you can wave. 
Ryan, these two guys at the back can also answer lots of questions. And basically, this is a system, the solution we sell. It has an S3 adapter, S3A for talking to Hadoop. Oh, great. I could have gone a bit more. Uh, it's got an S3 adapter, it's got a dupe adapter, and basically we can also use it as a generic S3 CMD type object storage. The key thing about this is what? We make disk drives, so we go off and we use 8 terabyte helium drives. Then we went to the market and said, you know what? We need a really good dense shelf. Who makes a 98 drive shelf? Anybody know? Nobody. So we had to go and bend some, sorry? Well, I think so, that then, but this is when this was evolving. This is two years ago, right? This is in, guys in R&D, right? And they were saying, no one makes one, so we have to go and build our shelf. So we went out and they built the shelf, 98 drives. They didn't even put two PDUs in it. It's only got one PDU. We don't care if the shelf fails. The second thing is, there's no LEDs to tell you that the drive's actually even failed. We're that confident in our software that you will not get a data loss. The other thing about that is we moved up the stack. We put clever erasure coding into, the, into the, uh, the set. So if you have a look on the website, there's a really good 3D tour, and it shows you how all the connections are done. And then the funny thing about this as well is all this stuff is great, and we're storing up to 4.7 petabytes in a single rack. Petabytes, guys, 4.7. That will get bigger, more durability. The other thing that really surprised me as well on the last point is its performance. Anyone like to guess its read performance? Ryan, what's its read performance? 3.5 gigabytes per second. So it's a quite a quick archive, right? So it's there. So that's me done for today, I think. Within time, is that? Because you look to me like you've got five minutes to go. If anyone's got any questions, please fire away. That's a really good point. So we look at the MTBF of a disk drive. And if you look at the lifespan, disk drives fail, even though we make the best disk drives in the world. Yeah, and we use helium. Is, yeah, there is a durability of a drive, right? But we've done a lot of equations looking at that, you know, the life cycle, five, ten years of a drive and what it is. And we think that's worth it. If we, drive's going to fail anyway. If we can reconstruct the data before the drive fails, job done. Anybody else? Is there, uh, is there room beyond 10 terabytes in your drives? Oh. Those physics, you start hitting the physics wall. There's a lot of stuff under NDA I'd love to tell you. <laughs> um, the answer is maybe, maybe not, yes or no. So a lot of the engineering guys talk to me and they say, you know, what's the limit, the density of a drive, right? And I remember when helium first came out. A lot of people in this room boo-booed it. Helium sucks, there isn't enough helium in the world. The, the, we're never going to get above an 8 terabyte drive, it has to be air. 10 terabytes come out. It would make sense for HGST to be looking significantly bigger into that. The other exciting thing as well is, now we've acquired SanDisk, and I was really pleased about Chris's presentation, we can look at Flash, so a high performance object store, and denser object stores in the future. So to answer your question, maybe. <laughs>